In this video, we're going to look at ways that calculus can actually give us inequalities. We're going to start with this first one right here. Suppose P, Q, and R are distinct. Can you bound P plus Q plus R all squared by some constant times P, Q plus P, R plus Q, R? And how big can you make that question mark constant? Uh, so let's try this. So let's look at the left-hand side and square it. If we do that, we have these terms where we pair a term in itself, like p and p, to get p squared. And then similarly, we get q squared and r squared. Then we have these cross terms, like pq and qp, which each appear twice. We have twice pq, twice pr, and twice qr. Okay, now p squared, q squared, and r squared are all non-negative. So this gives us that the left-hand side is greater than or equal to twice pq plus pr plus qr. So we definitely know that we can make the question mark greater than or equal to 2. But the question is, can we actually do better than this? And it turns out we can if we have calculus on our side in a very interesting way. So we're going to introduce a function f of x that has p, q, and r as its roots. So we'll use the function x minus p, x minus q, x minus r. Now the reason to do this at all, and we'll assume without loss of general generality that p is less than q is less than r, is that if you actually expand this polynomial, the pieces of the inequality we're interested in show up. So you get an x cubed, and then you get like negative p times the x and x in the other two binomials to give you something like minus p plus q plus r times x squared and then you get a pq plus pr plus qr times the x term and a constant term of pqr. So the inequality we're considering deals with the coefficients of this function. But we know what this function kind of looks like. It has three roots and as x goes to infinity it goes to negative infinity, sorry as x goes to negative infinity it goes to negative infinity, as x goes to infinity it goes to infinity. So the graph has to look something like this, where p, q, and r are the actual roots. And that tells us that the function itself has to have two critical points, right, where we see them labeled here in blue. And these critical points are points where the derivative is 0. If we take the derivative of the function we have, it's 3x squared minus twice the quantity p plus q plus r, and then plus or times x, and then plus pq plus pr plus qr. Okay, so this quadratic now we know has two distinct roots. So its discriminant, the b squared minus 4ac part, has to be strictly positive. All right, so if we let a be 3, b be the middle term, c be the last term, we get that 4 times the quantity p, q, p plus q plus r all squared has to be greater than 4 times 3 times p q plus p r plus q r. That is saying b squared is greater than 4ac. Now dividing each side, we see then that we can make the question mark actually a 3. So cool, calculus can help us improve the bound on the coefficient that we have. Of course, the question here is, can we do even better than this question mark 3 that we have? And we're going to show an interesting way to deal with things like this, um, where you have distinct values and you're not sure how to improve a constant and an inequality. So let's assume for a second that we didn't have that they're distinct. Then if we set P and Q and R all equal, we would probably get um, the best bound that we could. On the left-hand side here, we would get 9. On the right-hand, we'd get 3. And so the question mark would actually be equal to 3. We can't do better than 3 because we have an example where 3 is actually achieved. Okay, but we have the fact that things are distinct. So one way to handle something like this is to slightly perturb the entries. So we'll add just a little bit to Q and subtract that same little bit from R and analyze what happens in that situation. On the left-hand side, we'll get still that PQ plus R p plus q plus r is 3, and so we get 9 on the left-hand side when we square. 
Whereas on the right hand side, we get one times one minus epsilon and then one times one plus epsilon and then one minus epsilon times one plus epsilon. And so if you look at the net effect of perturbing Q and R just slightly, you get one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon, and then a one minus epsilon squared to give you a total of three minus epsilon squared. Okay, so if we look at the fraction P plus Q plus R all squared, divided by the thing on the left or the right hand side, which is PQ plus PR plus QR, we get for this chosen small value epsilon, nine minus three, uh, over three minus epsilon squared. Now, epsilon can be made arbitrarily small. We know that it's less than three, and so this ratio is greater than three, but we can make it arbitrarily close to three by picking epsilon really, really small. So if we make epsilon sufficiently small, we can get that the question mark is arbitrarily close to three. So three is the best that we can possibly do for the question mark, and it all came from analyzing through calculus. Okay, so a cool way to get inequalities and sharper bounds on inequalities using cal calculus to do so. In the next problem, we're gonna look at another application of calculus to get inequalities, but instead of using differential calculus, we're gonna look at integral calculus instead and compare areas to get an inequality. So the inequality we're gonna look at is the fact that ln of x, the quantity x plus one over x minus one is strictly less than 2x over x squared minus 1 for values of x greater than 1. Now, when you're faced with something like this, if you take a look at the left-hand side, you can write it as ln of x plus 1 minus ln of x minus 1. And so you see it as the difference of the evaluation of a function. What you can do is think about taking the derivative of that function and representing that difference as an actual integral. So ln's derivative is 1 over x. So we'll look at the graph of the function f of t is 1 over t. Then the area that we have is actually the integral from x minus 1 to x plus 1 of our function f of t dt. Okay, so we can represent the left-hand side that we're dealing with here as an actual area, we'll label x minus one and x plus one on the t-axis. And if we look at the area shaded here and marked in blue, that is the value of our integral i. All right, let's plot the points on the actual graph here. So we have x minus one, one over x minus one. And then the other point at x plus one is x plus one, one over x plus one. We can get an upper bound knowing the fact that the shape of the graph one over x looks like it does. If we draw in the line segment from the two points, the area of the red trapezoid here from the two points and then down to the points on the t-axis is an upper bound on the area of our inter integral or represented by an integral. So the integral is gonna be less than or equal to the length of the base times the average height at the two endpoints here. That's the area of the trapezoid. The base has length two because uh, x minus one and x plus one are two apart. Uh, and then the average height, uh, so the higher point has height one over the quantity x minus one, and the lower point has a uh, value or height one over x plus one. So the average is the difference over two. And that gives you one over the quantity x minus one minus, let's just say, one over the quantity x plus one, which when we work the algebra out, gives us exactly what's on the right-hand side, two x over the quantity x squared minus one. Now it seems random that the thing that we got was exactly what we wanted, but this is a good approach for using integral calculus to get inequalities. Look at the function that you have. If it's a difference of two things that look the same, ln of something in this case, 
then you can represent the differences in integral and get an upper bound using the shape of the function.